So here we are on the, the day, the ninth day, and this is our, our practice video. Now, this practice video will be more of a talk video because this practice is not, uh, as I've said for some of the other practices, it's not a classical sit down under the, under, the, under the meditation tree meditation where you close your eyes and you become still. It's a different kind of spiritual practice. It's a scholarly a spiritual practice. It's the kind of spiritual practice that will be familiar to anyone uh, who has been trained to work with, the, with classical texts, literary texts, great poetry of the world's traditions, but also scriptural scholars from the world's religious traditions. And any religious tradition with a fixed canon of sacred writings that has existed for more than a, a generation or two and has established educational institutions will have the familiar figure of the pundit, of the, of the, of the academic, uh, of the scholar uh, who uh, concerns himself or herself uh, with the proper interpretation of Scripture and also with the history of the Scripture and with the difficulties of interpretation that arise based upon different readings in the text or different sources of different Scriptures. So th this is a familiar figure in many religious traditions, the, the Scripture scholar. Um, and so the, the practice for today is from Sir John's writings, and this is one of his more bold statements, it's to update scriptures in light of science. Note, he didn't say update science in light of scripture. And we could also make an argument from that, that, that side as well. How, I do want to caution that I do not, I have the utmost respect for science and the scientific method. I, I am not here trying to veer off into some form of creationism or a kind of young earth creationism in which we might think the earth is only four or 5,000 years old. I think that people can make arguments for that, and they're certainly within their rights to do so. Um, but uh, this is not was not a concern of of, of John Templeton, um, if you as you can see from reading uh, his books. But uh, the other side in this case is that he calls for the updating of Scripture in light of science. Now, this has actually been going on for a long time. Um, in, in, in Judaism, uh, Spinoza, a famous philosopher, was also a kind of budding critic of the Bible, a, a critic in the academic sense of a person who was trying to understand how that book came to be. He was do, engaged in historical, he, he addressed historical questions about the text. Now, Spinoza did not have the tools that were later developed uh, by biblical scholars. Uh, uh, people studying both the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the scriptures of Judaism, and, and, the, uh, and the scriptures of Christianity, the, the New Testament, and later the other scriptures that were part of the early Christian world. But what actually began to happen around the year 1800 in European universities, notably in France, and then later particularly very strongly in Germany, so much so that it influenced theological and scriptural study throughout, throughout the, the, the Christian world after that, was the development of something that's known as historical criticism. And it was an attempt to try to peel back the layers of historical accumulation that kind of filtered people's understanding of the Scripture to get back, and these scholars were mostly Christians and almost invariably Christians at that time, to get back to the original thought world of Jesus. And in order to do that, they felt like they needed to get back to the original thought world of the Hebrew Bible. And and, and then to get back to the thought world of Jesus, it was required, of course, to understand everything that was available about the ancient world. So these were enormously learned disciplines. And still, the training in these, in these historical critical disciplines is at the very center of any kind of a master's level and certainly doctoral level study of the sacred scriptures of these two religious traditions of Judaism and of uh, Christianity. Now, admittedly, much of that historical criticism was, uh, on, on the Hebrew scriptures was practiced uh, early on in particular by Protestant Christian scholars. This was more of a, a discipline that was cultivated by Protestant Christians, particularly in Germany. Um, and uh, so, and this, this idea then of, of historical criticism is a direct application of the principle of uplate, updating scriptures in light of science. 
And uh, there are so many illustrations of this, but probably one of the easiest to grasp is um, is when one, if one were to sit down and read the four Gospels in the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, the central Christian scriptures, uh, and, their, and the order they're given in, in New Testament uh, editions, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you were to read them without any prior knowledge of these traditions, if you came to them completely new, but with a critical scholarly mind, perhaps trained as a scripture scholar in Hinduism or Islam, or in Judaism. It's hard to imagine that you would be completely unfamiliar with this tradition, but let's just imagine that you were, um, uh, and also uh, other religious traditions with scriptures have scholars as well. And you might be struck by a number of facts, not only that all four Gospels are about Jesus, and that there is a kind of common storyline, but that there's a lot of places, there are a lot of places where the storyline kind of diverges. And not only that, it seems to be that there are similar events, maybe even the same event, that occur or recur, but they have different emphases or different characters or, or different sayings associated with them. Now, this is an immensely learned field, and the controversies are infinite in all directions, and I'm only here to suggest that it's that recognition that maybe they were, gave rise to the uh, insight that perhaps these were edited by different people in different places. And this same idea arose actually earlier in studying uh, the first five books of the, of the Jewish scriptures. And this idea then that the, the, that the scriptural texts may actually have been shaped by the historical context and reflect different interests, this gave rise to the modern study of the, of the Jewish and crypt, Christian scriptures from a very historical standpoint. And this gave rise in the Jewish tradition uh, and, and the Christian tradition to what are thought of as more liberal forms of theology, Reform theology uh, uh, in Judaism or Reform Judaism, and then liberal Protestantism and then later Catholic scholars as well began to completely open themselves up to the study of these scriptural texts in light of the larger worlds of scientific and, and humanistic study. And the result was, in, in the Christian context, what, uh, a movement that has now declined, for the most part, known as liberal Protestantism or liberalism. And it was from the liberal Protestant approach that the modern Christianity of, say, 1950, which was very much at ease with Darwinism and Freud and Marx, uh, perhaps a little less with Marx, uh, was able to show ways. The, one of the great figures would be the, the theologian Paul Tillich, uh, a German-American theologian, but he is only symbolic of many other uh, European and, uh, and English-speaking uh, theologians who were able to bring these two worlds together, the worlds of science and the world of, of scriptural uh, wisdom and knowledge, and to produce what were often very creative, but sometimes perhaps transient interpretations. And there was a real updating of Scripture in light of science. It, it was completely possible for one to be a Christian or a Jew uh, and to be able to uh, not necessarily take all of the biblical stories as historical transcripts of events that occurred just the way they are apparently reported, and if, it, if someone were there with a, with a camera, as this camera is here, they would re, the, the scriptures record exactly what occurred at that point in time. Now, with the rise of, of, of fundamentalisms and, uh, again, uh, and with the rise of scriptural literalism, um, this example of these great traditions of learning, which were which boldly opened up the world of theology uh, and religious studies and scriptural studies to the worlds of science, 
I think is still a, a, a very salutary, very good to keep in mind. And today, I think the, the, the issue also is for science, the sciences, to open themselves up to the spiritual heritage of humanity, which, which is actually occurring. Uh, not so that you give up science for some kind of fundamentalism. No, so that these two dimensions of human life, both very important, the biological and physical side of our lives, as well as the humane and spiritual, uh, the emotional and the intellectual side of our lives can be brought back into harmony in a way that, that we find in Hindu scriptural texts, the Brahma Sutra, for instance, or in a Thomas Aquinas, or as we find in the great Muslim and, and Jewish theologians and philosophers, there was the sense of the unity of being. And out of that unity of being, all of the sciences, both religious and secular, they flow from that and they find their ultimate harmony in being.